Welcome to the Free Dive Cafe, episode 9, with Adam Stern. My name is Donnie. I'm the host of the Free Dive Cafe. The Free Dive Cafe is long form interviews that get into the backstories, the training, the challenges, the passions and fears and personal philosophies of those who choose to adventure on one breath. The Free Dive Cafe can be found at freedivecafe.com. All the episodes, show notes and links to social media can be found there. Soon I'm going to launch a written blog on the website. I'm going to write about my freediving experiences, my thoughts and feelings regarding the sport and the pastime, and I also plan to make way for guest posts and articles. I'm also going to launch a resources page where you'll find links to many other websites in the freediving community, links to YouTube channels and the websites for freediving schools and instructors and that kind of thing. If you would like your blog, page or channel to be featured on the resources page, get in touch with me and let me know and we'll see what we can do. I spoke at length about supporting the show through Patreon last time. This time I'll just say, if you love the show and you're the kind of person who would buy me a coffee to say thanks, head to the website and click the support the podcast button or go to the patreon.com slash freedivecafe page and you can do that. Straight on to today's guest. Adam Stern is one of the most requested guests so far for the show. He's made a bit of a name for himself on social media this last year or two with his vlogs and freediving tutorials on YouTube. And I'm happy to welcome him into the cafe to sit down and get to know him a little bit better. We discuss everything from effective training methodology, IDA competition rules and safety standards and lots more. Adam is an Australian freediver based in, well, everywhere. Adam competes and teaches freediving all over the world. He first started competing in 2011 and since then he has broken five Australian records and won a bronze medal in Vertical Blue in 2015 and a bronze medal in the Ida World Championships this year. His deepest dive to date was 104 meters with fins. Adam is a paddy freediver instructor trainer. He trains instructors all over the world, though notably he has trained dozens of instructors who were not able to afford the typical fees for free and has programs in place to continue doing so. Adam and I had a great laugh, as you'll find out. Enjoy the show, share the love, and let's dive. Yeah. <laughs> Adam, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. It's amazing. Absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Yeah. So you're just back from the World Championships in uh, Rotan. How was the mm-hmm. whole experience for you? Do you know what? This was the most complicated experience I've had in <laughs> freediving, I think. Um, you know, you, usually I, I go away. I'm, I'm ready to go. I start diving. I hit some PBs. I do some PBs in the competition and I go home happy. Whereas this one was, uh, wasn't quite ready, wasn't as prepared as I wanted to be, went to the competition, did some PBs, uh, failed a lot of dives that I wanted to do, and went home kind of upset. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, it wasn't the best competition for me, but I'll tell you what, I learned more. I learned more in this comp than any, than any other diving experience I've ever had. Yeah, I mean, I just saw the video that you uploaded. I mean, even just like, like I just watched it half an hour ago. Oh, um, uh, yeah. You, uh, and while you were still in Ruotan, you were saying that, you know, because you, I wondered why you turned early on your constant weight dive. You announced yeah. 104 and you turned early. And I was going to ask you about that. But, um, you know, for the listeners, explain what you said in the video about that, why you decided to turn early and why you ended up not competing in the no fins category. Well, basically, um, I sort of uh, had a bunch of stuff going on uh, in my life that uh, basically I, 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 tu- I turned up to Rotan to the World Championship 
you know, kind of worn out mentally, mostly mentally. I was in good physical shape, but mentally a bit worn out. And, you know, just over the, the weeks of diving, I actually wasn't really enjoying any of my deep dives. You know, I would go out there and get it done, um, and that'd be fine, but I wasn't, like, enjoying them, um, which in the past I always have. And so uh, it got to the um, the constant weight day of the World Championships, and I just sort of woke up that morning, and I was just, I was just, I just felt spent. I just felt spent mentally, and I knew that if I went out to that platform, I could do my dive, and I knew that I wouldn't enjoy it. And I just thought to myself, it's not worth um, burning the love of freediving out of me. It's not worth going out there and having a bad dive just to. Uh, pull off uh, a dive in competition. Mind you, I tell you what, if I did know in hindsight that that dive would have got me a bronze medal, maybe I would have done it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was a battle between the, 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 the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other shoulder, right? Well, I didn't, I didn't know the dive was going to be a medal dive, but, uh, you know, you never know that in the, in the World Championships. But, um, no, I mean, <laughs> uh, I made the right call because I wouldn't have enjoyed it. And the thing is, is that uh, if you... If you burn that love out, or the, like if you if you destroy the actual love of diving from yourself, or you t- um, you sort of burn it away, like uh, it's just hard to come back the next season, right? It's hard to motivate yourself to go off and dive deep again because your last memory, your last impression of these deep dives was one of discomfort, pain, and you know non enjoyment. So, so I decided that it was best to just cap my experience off there and have a bit of a holiday and. Um, you know, go home, rest, and get ready for the next one. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like you made the most mature possible decision there, right? Um, yeah, that's how I felt. I felt like it, it was the only time I made it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I feel like I did. I made a mature decision. <laughs> so, I mean, was that a was that a decision that you came to came came to purely by yourself, or was you know you, you were surrounded by other experienced free divers and friends as well? Did they kind mm-hmm. of help you to come to that realization that maybe it wasn't such a good idea to push for for the numbers? Uh, do you know what? Actually, it was the opposite. Everyone around me was saying, "Oh, look, you'll be fine. You've got this, and it's only one dive." Um, but you know, the truth is, is that um, no one knows what's going on in a free diver's head. Uh, no one knows what it's. No one knows what the dives are like for you. And before we had the dive eye, no one knew what the dives looked like either. <laughs> but um, so I mean, all the advice I was getting was, "Oh, look, you'll be fine. Just just go out there and enjoy it." And I was trying to do that, but I just found that on the morning, I just couldn't. I just couldn't bring myself to go out there and enjoy it. Um, I was um, I was uh, at the end of my uh, my tank. You know, I was I was empty. So I just didn't have, you know, because that's the thing. Like, even though these these dives are beautiful and nice, and um, and not necessarily pushing, you know, my, my, myself to the limit. Like a, a 104 meter dive is not my limit, right? So it's not necessarily like a really hard dive, but it still requires a level of focus and attention and just like command of the mind. And if you're worn out mentally, you just don't want to do that. You just don't want to take control of life. You don't want to. Um, you know, focus your mind on this one task and, and basically hold your shit together for it. <laughs> mm. I just wanted to, to <clears throat> let it all go and unwind. Mm. So your head just wasn't in it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, you stepped on a sea urchin, I saw. Does that still hurt? <laughs> yeah. Man, I still have like 15 spines oh, man, in my yeah, feet. They're going to be there for months. I did it once as well. I stepped in one in Greece and I, I swear to God, I had like 50 feckin' spines in my foot. And yeah. I think like two oh, months was... later, man, that my foot was still sore. Yep. Yep. My, my mind's still sore right now. I still got spines in all my toes. It's horrible. <laughs> I, <know. Yeah. laughs> I saw the one that kind of like, it goes in at like the awkward angle on your on your small oh, toe, you know. It's that's like, uh, still in there and it yeah. hurts so much. I feel bad for you, man. I hope that gets better uh, as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah, me too. It'll, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Not too bad. Yeah. And uh, I think one of these days I'm just going to, you know, summon my courage and start digging some of them out. <laughs> yeah. The good thing is that like over time your body kind of like pushes them towards the surface so they do get yeah. easier to remove. So. Yeah, uh, you you do kind of get that weird like toenail clipping pleasure, you know, like when you sort of pull on the last right? remnants of them out. So pulling them out, it's gonna be so good. Something to look forward to. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you still achieved a national record for um, Australia in free immersion, which was um, yeah. Do you know what ninety two yeah. meters, right? And yeah, the bronze right. medal. You know, the bronze medal was interesting. I mean, 
nine people had to fail their dives from right. me at that so point. So just explain a little, <laughs> just explain to the listeners who didn't see what happened, how that came about, how the logistics of that came about. Well, basically, um, we all announce our dives the night before, and you know, free immersion is probably my weakest discipline. So I announced what was a very shallow dive for me and what was a you know a, a relatively shallow dive uh, for the competition oh, i was like a mid-level dive you know um there were in total there were 11 divers that were going deeper than me that day and nine of them um uh, failed their dives they either blacked out or they turned early or they uh, failed their surface protocol or in some way they failed their dives so that i wound up with a with a medal and which was a, a huge surprise because like um there were so many people in front of me, and you know, I, I, I was, I mean, I, I, I was a medal contender for the constant weight for sure, but not for um, the free immersion at all. <laughs> but yeah, I wound up with a bronze medal for free immersion. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. So, do you have any kind of like long-term competition goals? I mean, do you think far ahead in that sense? Do you oh yeah. Have your world record. You, you have world your mindset record. on world, world records record. one day, yeah. <laughs> What is it, 150, no fins, something like that? Yeah, right, no fins. No, I would like the constant weight world record one day. Don't tell Alexi about that. You're going to have to wrestle that from him uh, violently. I know, I he won't like that. it. Yeah. <laughs> might have to uh, spike his breakfast or something like that. My my bum isn't as big as his. That's how he, he's got that constant weight ask, you know? That's where the power I is, just man. Swap more. Bum. It yeah. is. Yeah, you can store loads of oxygen in there, too. <laughs> uh, once you've achieved a goal... Do you, like, for example, uh, imagine you had a goal to reach 100 meters. Um, it wasn't just like you turned up there one day. Um, yeah. Do you find Do you find your motivation dropping off afterwards when when something like no. that happens? No, my my de- my goal was never 100 meters. Like 100 meters was a great milestone, but my goal was always to be uh, one of the best, if not the best, freedivers in the world. So it's not necessarily. Um, uh, about hitting a specific depth. I mean, if my goal was 100 meters, absolutely, I'm sure my motivation would have dropped right off. But um, th- this is why I also don't really care about national records. I mean, I think national records are quite tacky. Um, we always talk about how we're not really competing against other people, and then we all like value these silly little records. And and what do they prove that some person from my country went to that depth? Like. What if I'm unlucky and I'm from New Zealand? Uh, you know what I mean? I have to have a world record to get a national record. It's just, um, it's, it's some, I think, I think it's, it's, uh, like a reality from a sport which don't, doesn't actually have legitimate, uh, like national championships as in competitions. So you could, like, you know, everyone from Australia goes to this, uh, Australia, there is an Australian depth championship, but no one really goes to it. At least Australia's best divers don't really go to it. Um, and if we all did, then you'd win that and you'd be like, cool, I'm the Australian champion. And then we wouldn't care about these national records. But because we all compete in these random international competitions, what we have to stack up against each other is these national records. I just don't, for me, I always, uh, I always competed in my head, at least on a world stage. I was always concerned with only my world ranking and these uh, national records that people seem to congratulate me on felt very silly to me. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, yeah, I understand what you mean. It's kind of like puts a dampener on my plans to change my citizenship to Bhutanese and uh, get all the records. Um, yeah, thanks for spoiling that for me, Adam. But um, you're very welcome. Yeah. I, I am here to to, to spoil dreams. No, you just you 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 put the record straight for me there. Thanks. Um, <laughs> so this world record um, goal, how long do you think that's going to take you? Uh four years. Right, four years on the dot. Can we mark a date down? Yeah, yeah. What's the date today? Uh, <laughs> uh, God knows. I'm not very good with that kind of thing. <laughs> no, am I? Uh, we're, we're in September. September. September sometime. Like September sometime. 14th, 15th. Yeah, 2021. <laughs> Done. Right. Okay. I'll be there. Um, <laughs> so let's backtrack a little bit and just go over your backstory a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. Where did you? Where are you from? And uh, how did you end up freediving? Uh, I'm from a very small town about an hour and a half north of Sydney called Copacabana. Awesome. Uh, Such a great name. Pop- <laughs> right? Population of about 2,000 people. Um, little beach town. So I, I grew up surfing, a little surfing town. And uh, I was just literally uh, backpacking around Asia. And um, like every other person, I found myself uh, walking into a freediving school in Koh Tao. And I, 
did a course, and that was that was it. That was the beginning. Um, so you did your first uh, you did your first course with apnea total, and um, when you first did free diving, was it something that came naturally to you? Was it easy for you? Did no, you- not at all. I was not a great free diver, and I'm still not a talented free diver. I, I, at no point in time would anyone say, "Wow, Adam's Adam's talented at this." Um, you know, I, I, I meet talented freedivers all the time, and I, I'm like, man, I worked for years to do what you're doing easily. Uh, <laughs> um, but, yeah, so, uh, I mean, freediving was the first sport I ever did. I never did anything before that, really. I was, um, you know, I was interested in writing in the theatre. That's where I studied in university beforehand and everything, and then I got into freediving, and I suppose had to develop myself into an athlete. I definitely didn't start as one. I wasn't like a sporty person whatsoever, um, but but yeah. So no, I def I definitely wasn't talented. I definitely wasn't a good freediver straight off the bat. And I remember when I was doing my master course in Kotal, there were a group of four of us all doing the master course together. And I was the worst out of all of us. You know, like everyone else could do these big dives and these big big statics, and I was just struggling to you know <laughs> keep up. <laughs> So what was it that you found most difficult um, about it in the beginning? Was it equalization or Oh, just, just holding or... my breath. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, all of the above. Well, I mean, I, I've, uh, I've never really had serious issues with equalization, which has um, always been a benefit for me. But um, uh, I don't know. I just wasn't great. I just wasn't wasn't natural or fluid in the water i wasn't uh, comfortable with like long breath holds i'm not I'm, I'm i wasn't then and i'm still not capable now of really pushing myself not that i believe that you should push yourself in free diving but i'm still not really capable of doing it like i said i have friends who rock up to comps and they rock up to comps going oh wow man like i'm tired i'm fatigued and all these things and they just bust out these huge dives and when i'm tired and fatigued i go home did you, when you first started, did you find that uh, the breath holds were um, really uncomfortable? Like you had early contractions and oh yeah, contractions. Yeah, I got horror. Like, yeah, I always sympathize with people who are like, oh man, like, like when I get contractions, I feel like I'm going to die. And I'm like, yeah, I felt the same. <laughs> like I, I used to have real issues with with uh, the urge to breathe and contractions. I remember I did so much dry static training to try to be comfortable with it. Because everyone kept telling me I'd be comfortable with it eventually. I just, it just took me months. But eventually things did settle out for you and you kind of like yeah, started to improve. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Definitely yeah. did. They definitely did. But I'm still a bit of a CO2 machine. Like, I still get contractions on the way down of all my dives. And, you know, I don't know. I just, um, I don't know. Maybe I'm metabolizing things too fast and producing too much CO2 too early. I don't know. i got to work on that. But uh, I'm still a bit of a CO2 machine. Yeah. <laughs> So where do you um, where do you train now most often? Like uh, back in Australia, where do you where do you, well, where a, do you train and who do you train with? Well, in, in Australia, I only I only pull train. I go to the gym and I pull train because we don't have any real conditions for depth, and the conditions that we have, like they wouldn't be of any benefit to me in my training. Um, so I have some good friends who uh, I train with in the, like in the pools um, on on the Central Coast, just uh, you know north of Sydney. And we've got an awesome little um, like freediving community that we've sort of started up, uh, myself and some of the other guys there. Mostly them, actually, because I'm always in and out of the country, but they actually keep the club together. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I've got some good friends that I train with there, but no, they, they, they compete in pool competitions, but not depth competitions. But, in, but when I shoot off, I, I, I usually just go to the location of the competition and then just train up before then. Uh, like, you know, just, just basically working on my depth adaptation, you know, for my training in the pools at my, in the pools where I do all my conditioning and fitness and all that kind of stuff for free diving. And then I shoot off and just start uh, adapting to depth. And do you work with a coach to do that? Or do you just kind of program things for yourself? Uh, yeah, I just, I just program things for myself. I have a, a CrossFit coach, uh, Paulie Knowles, and he has a, um, his CrossFit uh, center is, Cohort CrossFit in um, Erina. God, it used to have another name. That's why I'm stumbling over that. That's all we renamed it recently. But yeah, so I, I have a, I have a like a like a strength and conditioning coach, but not a free diving coach. Um, and it's probably because anyone that I'd want to coach me at the moment, at least, is one of my competitors. Um, 
but also, uh, I just, I don't know, there's prob, it'd be, st- I've never had a coach before. It'd be strange, I think. I'm gonna, I think I might give it a go though. I don't know. Well, it seems like, <laughs> it seems like you're doing quite well with that one at the moment. So maybe you should just stick with that. Uh, that yeah, method. yeah. yeah. Well, I, I don't know many people that have a coach for free riding. Um, so you, you do CrossFit as part of your complementary training. Uh, talk, yeah. a li- talk a little bit about that and why you think it's such a good way to uh, complement freediving training. Well, it's just it's just great high intensity interval training, and um, all of the movements uh, are functional movements, so they're like things that you're doing every day. And especially, uh, what I really like actually is a lot of the Olympic lifting, like the um, the snatches and the cleans and the clean and jerks and things like that, because they're you use your entire body and use a huge amount of your core, like your lower back and your abdominals and your legs, especially like your quads and things like that. Um, so they're, they're very complex movements that involve the entire body, which is very similar to um, uh, swimming with a monofin as well, especially if you look at the movements of a, of a clean, um, which is when you lift the bar from, like the barbell from the bottom and you lift it up so it's um, up on top of your, well, on the front of your chest. Yeah, I think with that, you know, like high intensity and also with CrossFit, it's quite sustained, like there's quite a bit of sustained anaerobic training as well. And I think exactly that really helps yeah. with the, um, the, the, the free diving, uh, especially on like swims back to the surface when you're, Absolutely. When you're kind of low on oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I sprint to back to the surface, which is I, it's just my style. I quite like it. So it's, it's my body, uh, I think works quite well anaerobically because of all CrossFit. Um, yeah, no, I, I, one of those things as well is I also have almost no issue with lactic on my dives at all. Like when people talk about lactic, I, sometimes I'm just confused. Like, how is it possible that you get lactic on these dives? Um, cause even sprinting up from, you know, a hundred odd meters or so, I don't get lactic. And I think yeah, so much of it has to do with the, um, the, all well, the crossfit I do in the, the hit training. <clears throat> so how, um, how deep do you dive now? Well, PB is 106 constant weight. So You're well over the 100 meter, uh, I wouldn't say well, power here, but the uh, that, that my, point. Mark, well, yeah. well over the 100, I'm only 6 meters over 100 meters. Uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, 6 meters is, I think it's considerable enough to say that. I mean... Uh, yeah, well, it took it took me over a year to go from 100 to 106. So right, well, that's what it, I was going to ask you, was like, how, <laughs> how long did it take you to reach that level? Well, I, re- I reached 100 in VB Vertical Blue 2016, so which was May last year, and then it took me until uh, August 2017 to get to 106. Um, basically, okay, so uh, last year, uh, May, I reached 100. Last year, October, I reached 105, and then this year, I tacked that extra meter on <laughs> to 106. <Right. laughs> and, and to from when you started free diving to where you are now, how many years has that been? Uh, we are at. It's a hard question because when did you start free diving? I mean, for me, I did like a course and then went away and you know lived life for like six months and came back and did another course so i mean from when i started it'd be like six years but from when i started like properly training you know it'd be about four four years and in those four years would you say it's been a very gradual and steady and constant progression or has it kind of been Um, big jumps no no most of the time it's been a gradual constant progression but there were times of of fast jumps and there were times of plateaus but if you looked at it as a whole, if we wanted to make a graph out of it, it'd probably look pretty steady. <laughs> what is your favorite discipline? Constant weight. Why? Um, uh, well, okay, this is how I break it down. Okay, th- uh, there, are, there are two real disciplines in freediving, right? That's uh, with fins and without fins. Free immersion is the least athletic and it has nothing to do with swimming, which is why I just don't like doing it because i think it's um i just think it's a nothing discipline to be honest a nothing discipline uh, pretty strong words yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well i'll tell you what let's put it this way um it looks like uh things may be going in the direction of cmas in terms of the largest comps in the world and where all the money's going to be for free diving and cmas do not have a, a discipline called free immersion they don't do free immersion at all so who knows what's going to happen there but um uh, I mean, like, I think, I think no fins is the, uh, I mean, I think if, if, if we look at it in terms of, uh, 
like philosophical standpoint, no fence would be my favorite discipline because it's the most pure and the most, uh, it's where you have the greatest command of your body and it's about you diving without any assistance and it's beautiful. Uh, the only other thing about, about that is that I really like going deep. Uh, I really enjoy the depth itself. And so with swimming with fins, I can get deeper than I could without fins. So that's why uh, my favorite discipline is, uh, you know, constant weight with fins. And then after that would be constant weight with, that, with no fins. And then free immersion is just this silly thing I do every now and again. Um, <laughs> just to get records. Because, yeah, pretty much. So I can use it for marketing and all that nonsense, you know. But um, they're not my favorite dives, and I always, I'm always a little bit, uh, I'm always a little bit. I have like a chip on my shoulder about free immersion, because um, I've always gone significantly deeper in constant weight, but they haven't been Australian record dives. And so, let's say, for example, uh, in vertical blue, I dove to 100 meters. This was my first 100 meter dive. So I do a 100 meter dive, and then I do like a like an 88 meter free immersion dive. And everyone's like, wow, man, congrats on your national record. I'm like, I don't care about this national record. Didn't you see me yesterday go 12 meters deeper? <laughs> so and that's always been the case with me in free diving. Um, uh, I, I always got more recognition for these national record dives and free immersion than I did for what I viewed to be much bigger dives and much more impressive dives in constant weight only because the free immersion were Australian records. Um, so that's just my chip on my shoulder, but you know, I'll get over it. <laughs> <laughs> and if you, if you had, um, decided to compete in the no fins, what kind of depth would you have announced? Well, that's a secret, Donnie. Well, you can tell me. It's <laughs> um, well, uh, no, I'm going to keep that one, that card close to my chest for now because, um, I, I I plan to do some no fin, some proper no fin training next year, and yeah, I've got some goals in mind that would be lovely for me. So it's just like I feel like so much of my life is public with all the stuff I do on the internet, with the the social media, and now the vlogs and everything like that. Like I feel like so much of it's public, and sometimes I just want to hold one or two things to myself. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> I'll, I'll wait with bated breath to to see to what see my magic. mediocre no fin dive. Fifty five meter, uh, right? Five meter no fin. Can you fins, imagine yeah. at the end of the day? I I turn around and I do like a, a sixty meter no fin dive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, so you do plan to kind of like shift your attention in that direction uh, in the coming oh, years? Yeah, definitely. Um. So, I mean, like, I'm not going to ask you too much about specific training here. Um, usually, when people ask me questions to ask guests, it's always specific questions. I know that it just, like, annoys most freedivers, um, especially experienced ones, like, about CO2 tables and stuff like that. So, I, I see, The thing is with, with CO2 tables is that, like, they're not very hard to invent for yourself. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, the concept of a CO2 table is so simple. And people are like, oh, what's, give me an example of a table. I'm like, just go invent one. You'll be right. Like, what do you think? I, I've just invented them. No one, no one handed me the secret book of CO2 tables. <laughs> because you've got a lot of good videos on the subject as well on YouTube, right? I mean, not just CO2 tables, but how to in, uh, increase your breath hold, how to equalize and that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> and of course, for anyone listening, I'm going to link to Adam's channel, which is Adam Freediver, right? Adam Fruitover. All right. Um, <laughs> so that will be linked to in the show notes so you guys can easily find that. But I'm going to ask you two general questions. Mm -hmm. um, is there something that you see avid free divers spending a lot of time on that you think is just a complete waste of time and energy? Okay. Um, every time uh, I, I chat to these divers, the, the biggest or the, mo the most common question they ask me is about lung stretching. Like, um, uh, like, oh, you know, like, should I be doing lots of like packing and reverse packing and lung stretching and like now, now is that what it's called? I don't do a lot of yoga, so I don't know the terms very well, but like, you know, all that kind of stuff with your stomach and my, like my response is just no, like just go and dive. <laughs> um, I think the thing is, is that, uh, people have this really strange idea that if you suck your stomach in or if you, uh, inhale very deeply and then move your chest about, you're going to in some way simulate a uh, hydrostatic pressure, like the pressure from the ocean. And it just doesn't in any way do that. So I think that you'd be better off just going and diving as opposed to doing all this lung stretching training, which has got nothing to do with your lungs. It's like 
It's actually just the tissues surrounding your lungs and the muscles surrounding your lungs. Um, so that's definitely what I think to be just a wrong, just, it's, it's, it's just the, not where the focus should be. And if, if it comes from this mentality of like, oh, cool, that's the next trick that's going to get me over, over the hump. You know, that's, that's the technique. Whereas people don't place enough emphasis on just repeating dives and just being relaxed and just improving your actual diving technique and just having fun and allowing the depth to come when you're ready and not like looking for the next thing that's going to just hurdle you to, to whatever finish line that you've got. Uh, and that always seems to be the one. Everyone wants to pack more. Everyone wants to reverse pack more. Everyone wants to do some crazy lung stretching. And yeah, I feel so much better after it, they say. And it's like, oh, no, I don't think you do. I think you're just tricking yourself psychologically, but you know. Well, maybe you maybe tricking yourself psychologically is a good thing as well, right? And uh, free diving. Well, I disagree um, only because I find, uh, and this is for myself included. Uh, I tell you what, I tell you who I have immense respect for as a diver is Alexei Molchanov because he wakes up in the morning, no matter what he had for breakfast, no matter what he had for dinner, he, he wakes up in the morning, does zero stretching, does nothing at all, and goes out there and punches out world record dives. <laughs> Um, and I'm not exaggerating. That's exactly how it happens. And, you know, I just spent the last six weeks with him in the world championship and he eats. Oh, sorry, Alex, if you're listening to this, his <laughs> diet is horrible. His diet is horrendous. And he just, he's just a machine. And the, why he's been able to do that is because he's stripped away all these silly psychological, what people feel like are helping them, but actually become barriers because you depend on them. As soon as you depend on something, it's really a limitation. Oh, I can't go out there and do my big dive now because I didn't uh, stretch and warm up for an hour. Oh, you know, I didn't do this last night. I didn't do this this morning. And you don't need to do them. And we have the evidence for it, as in these dives are getting done without it. And same, Dave Mullins does not a lick of stretching or anything. Just wakes up in the morning, rolls out of bed, and goes and dives. Bang, 126 meters constant weight. So there's just too much evidence to support, I feel like, the, the alternative style. And even for myself, uh, all the rituals that I've made up over the years, all the different stretching and, and things that I've done, I feel like right now are just a hindrance. So I think what what is short term a bit of a benefit, a long term is actually like you know you sort of uh, cutting off uh, your leg despite your foot. Is that the saying? Is that the saying? Cutting off your foot despite your leg? I don't know. You know what I'm saying there. <laughs> yeah. Um. So you think that people are just overcomplicating things basically for themselves? Absolutely, they are. Absolutely. Uh, I make a, a point when I'm teaching so like advanced freediving courses to not do any stretching um, because uh, they, they simply don't need it. You don't need to stretch to dive to 30 meters. Like, you just, just go and dive. <laughs> um, yeah, we definitely complicate this thing too much. And I think that a huge part of that is because we, uh, at least in the beginning, freediving borrowed so heavily from yoga. And so there's always been this thing where, like, oh, you know, yoga and stretching are integral to freediving. But um, I, I don't believe they are. And I don't, for example, there's, there's no other course in any other sport you could go and do. And you'd start with, like, a whole bunch of stretching exercises, um, if you know what I mean. You know, you don't go and do a bit of rock climbing. And they're all like, oh, cool, let's, in, in, in this, in the actual criteria of this course is a lot of stretching. Like, that just doesn't happen. So... I think it's a culture as opposed to something that that, that uh, is essential or that really works for the sport mm. itself. Yeah, but I think it's. I mean, I think it's like highly individual, right? I mean, you don't have that background. You're not. That's not your in your personality. It's um, it's not going to do you any good. But in my own case, you know, I I do do yoga. I do have that kind of background of yoga and meditation and you know stretching and I, I absolutely you know maybe I've conditioned myself to feel that way. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I really feel like, uh, doing yoga before the, I go for the, the diving that day improves many facets of my, my diving, you know, just my, my general physical condition, the feeling of my physical conditioning and the, the state of my mind. So it's, it's surely it's individual as well, right? Absolutely. But what if you could feel that way without doing the yoga? Yeah, you know, but... Um, well, I mean, I, I like, I mean, doing keep in mind, I'm, <laughs> I'm saying this purely from an athletic standpoint, right? Like I'm not talking about, uh, uh like I, I'm talking about what's best for performance. And I think what's best for performance is having as little ritual as possible, because I feel like the, the, the divers that I've observed over the years, the more rituals they have, the more often they turn early or the more often they fail dives because the rituals must also 
go well. As in, like, you know, if you uh, rely on stretching every morning, then the stretching must feel good every morning. What happens if you wake up and feel a little bit tight one morning? Or, you know, something along the way. Or you don't get the same buzz out of your stretch. Uh, you're going to feel mentally a little bit thrown off as opposed to if you didn't ever do those things. And you, just, you just went and you'd feel the same no matter what. Mm. I, I envy you, Adam. I still have my... <laughs> I still have my crutches and I'm going to have to hold on to a few of them in the oh, meantime. Oh, dude, I still yeah. have my crutches too. I'm not there yet. I'm just, I'm just talking about this ideal that I've seen. I'm not saying I do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm after it though. <laughs> Another kind of general question. Um, if you don't have access to the open water or even a pool, what do you think is the best training that someone could still do? Oh, mate, go for apnea walks. Well, it depends. Like, what's the best training for what, right? Like, uh, I think that people want this overarching, like, simplification of training for freediving, whereas there's really only tra- training for, for something specific in freediving. So if you want, if you don't get to dive a lot and you want to improve your diving, then a combination of dry static breath hold and apnea walking will be really good. Right. I mean, um, it just makes if, sense, doesn't it? It's kind of just common yeah. sense, like, yeah. Yeah. You know, like if you wanna if you wanna be more comfortable when you're diving and you don't have access to water, then uh, try to simulate the moving of, of finning while you're holding your breath. And the best way we can do that is walking. Or if you really want, you can lay on your back, hold your breath, and scissor kick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. What do you think are the biggest? Um, I mean, you've kind of touched on it a little bit there already. But what do you think are the biggest mistakes that beginners are making in free diving? Um. The biggest mistakes that beginners are making in freediving. I, I, I really, okay. The biggest mistake that, that, that uh, the biggest mistake that beginners make in freediving is that they focus too much on the numbers. And that's the mistake that almost everyone makes in freediving, if that means myself included at times, right? Um, but it's, it's hard for a beginner because, uh, what happens is they progress very quickly, right? Because in the beginning, all we're really doing is tapping into this potential that already already exists. Um, and then, uh, so they go, oh, cool, five meters, bang, 10 meters, 15, 20, and they get all this rapid progression and they start to get hooked on the numbers. And then, and then things get a little bit more challenging and I think part of the frustration they feel is the fact that they've been hitting these targets so easily and, and they really develop this sense of achievement from hitting the targets themselves as opposed to the sense of achievement coming from the pleasure of the dive um, and enjoying the dive. I mean, the, the, the greatest, the greatest uh, success in freediving is having the greatest joy in freediving. And this is something that I also observe at even the highest level. You know, like the best freedivers in the world probably just love freediving more than other people. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they just keep going out there to free dive. And consequently, they just keep getting deeper because they can. Um, but, yeah, so I, I think they, the, fo- the focus on goal setting is the worst thing that beginners do all the time. And they just need to take it away. And instructors need to take it away, especially with, like, static breath hold. Like, I, I hate seeing uh, instructors encouraging students to, to, you know, keep going on, hit that next target, all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? I think, like, static breath hold especially should be this just – just a, a, a exploration of your body in terms of sensation, um, just just feeling out and extending the the period of time that you can be comfortable and relaxed and and enjoy the breath hold as opposed to, you know, hitting that next target. You know, oh, let's try to hit three minutes today. Oh, cool, you did three. Oh, I want to I want to be able to hold my breath for four minutes. Like, who cares? No one cares if you can hold your breath for three or four or five minutes. Like, it doesn't mean anything. It's just what it means to you. And if, if you can do a stressful breath hold to five minutes, then that's not as good as someone who can re- like get to three minutes completely relaxed. And I think, you know, it's, it's a good point you made. You know, it seems like in this day and age, you can't just, people can't just go out and do something simple for the sake of doing oh. it and enjoy the actual act of doing it without trying Absolutely. to quantify it in some way or compete with somebody or themselves in mm-hmm. some way or... You know, yep. have something to post. And uh, um, in fairness, you know, all the instructors that, I, that I've had, maybe I've just been lucky, have all made the same point that you've just made, which is like, you know, you've really got to forget about the numbers and just enjoy the sensation of the dive. And um, yeah, but it's really hard to take that out of people. It is. It is. It's like you got to beat them over the head with it again and again and again. Yeah. <laughs> I it, it almost, I think it almost helps. Like I, I did, I had a four, you know, like I kind of like, 
I, you know, now that I'm at, at the point where like I don't really have anywhere else to go, so now I can really just focus on the uh, the free diving, right? In terms of the, mm, the idle right. ladder. So it, I think it you get that experience with time. It does come with time. That's exactly right. Yeah, absolutely. And and also, you know, having a bad experience at 15 meters is one thing, but having a bad experience at 40 meters is really another thing as well. So um, yeah, when that happens to you, it kind of it can really you know, encourage you to start thinking differently about how you approach your diving. Oh, look, I tell you what, I've had dives at 100 meters where I came up thinking, oh my God, I hate this, get me out of here. And when you have one of those experiences, that changes your diving forever. Yeah. Have you ever had a, have you ever had like a scary accident or a bad injury from free diving? <clears throat> um, well, golly gosh, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, well, let's go down the list. Well, I mean, look, um, I've had uh, lung squeezes before. Um, now, obviously, I'm not the, uh, like a squeezer because no one who dives to my depths really could be because by the time you'd get there, you'd have torn your lungs to pieces and you just wouldn't have had the chance to get that deep over that many years, right? So, But I have had the occasional lung squeeze, which is not fun. Um, and I have had decompression illness from freediving, which is also not fun. And I've blacked out, and you know, uh, I've never had a nasty blackout though. I've never had like a never blacked out underwater. I've never had a blackout where I was unconscious for longer uh, than like a few seconds, really. I tell you what, I've never had a blackout that I couldn't have just that I didn't revive myself from. But mm-hmm. you know what I mean? That I was I was unconscious, and I pulled myself out of it, right? So they've always been pretty tame as as far as blackouts go. <laughs> Um, the worst thing I think was the decompression illness and that was, so tell, um, tell us exactly how that came about because it's pretty, it's not very typical for free divers. So how did that? No. Happen? Well, I was spearfishing for, for three days in a row and we were diving, literally diving no deeper than 10 meters. Um, and you know, because it was so shallow, I was able to just go up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down and not spend any time uh, on the surface. Hundreds of times in the same day, probably. Oh, yeah, absolutely. For, yeah, for, for, for three days in a row. And, uh, yeah, I just gave myself no surface interval. And then um, on the evening of the third day, I get out of the, out of the water, take my wetsuit off, and I'm covered in this red rash, and my skin's all tingling, and I'm, like, extremely fatigued. Um, and uh, we were kind of in the middle of nowhere, and so I couldn't really get anywhere which was going to have emergency oxygen. But uh, it, it was a pretty mild case of decompression illness, and it was sort of it taking care of itself in a few hours. So, but it was scary, you know. It's mm-hmm. um, decompression illness is not fun. So, how did it actually feel? Would it be some like a little bit like heat exhaustion or something like that, or was it? Oh, actually, in, in terms of the, f- the fatigue, would be very, very similar to heat exhaustion. Um, just this, like, like you know, kind of like when you jet lag as well, you know, like you just can't fight it almost you know you can't keep yourself awake or, you, or you're so so worn out like it's very hard to explain that kind of fatigue i don't know i'd never experienced it before and uh and then the, yeah just just i had a rash that was all tingling and sort of itchy all over my body there's been a bit of debate going on recently about the um the surface protocol and the safety standards and the added competitions um, yeah um you know, and, and this this year at the World Championships, we kind of had a a really different view of the whole thing because it was it was broadcast live. Everything was broadcast live. We had to dive eye, follow every diver from the surface to the bottom and back up again. We saw all the surface protocols and the blackouts and all that kind of thing. Do you think there's a problem with the surface protocol? Hundred um, percent. Yeah. And what what do you think is the problem, and what do you suggest to fix it? Well, there. Are- there are several problems, I think, with the surface protocol. Okay. Number one, surface pro- people have this impression that the surface protocol plays a role in limiting people's blacking blackouts and things like that. It serves no purpose at all in restricting people's dives to make them not dive to the point where they're hypoxic or going to black out. Like, in no way does it shape that decision-making whatsoever. Um, and so that's just a bit of a fallacy that people are holding on to. Um, the other thing with the surface protocol is it, it genuinely uh, hasn't taken a, into account uh, levels of narcosis that were not previously seen, um, which, you know, is probably the, the lesser of all these arguments, you know, because you can deal with it. But but this just means that, OK, cool. So um, we're also trying to make sure you don't get too narked, <laughs> right? 
as opposed to too hypoxic. Um, but for me, the real, the main concern with it is that I want freediving to be a, a mainstream spectator sport, and I believe it can be. And I think the more complications we have in between our sport uh, and the process of it gaining a mainstream audience, uh, I think we need to take all these things out. And, and one of the confusing and what I think to be archaic and silly uh, aspects of our sport is the surface protocol. Um, it's, it's confusing for someone to just come along to the sport without knowing what's going on. And someone does this dive, and all of a sudden they get d- d- disqualified, and they're like, "Oh God, why did that happen?" And, and then they're like, "It's so, it's so complex." As in, you can be uh, uh, disqualified uh, for for such small reasons that you couldn't even really pick up on the camera. It's just the judge seems to be to, to see it, right? And it's it's hard to explain to an audience, and it's it's unjustified to an audience too. They see someone do this dive. I mean, look, Alexi's dive, for example. They see him do this 121 meter free immersion dive. He comes up, gives the OK sign away from the judge, but then he turns around and he's fine. He's not hypoxic. He's just knocked off his head. Um, and then people are like, why did he get disqualified? Like everyone was confused, and that 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 hinders the growth of our sport. And um, I mean, look, everyone has their own, this is the thing. Everyone has their own motivation in in freediving, right? Some people are like, oh, you know, I think it's good because it keeps it safe, or they just want to hang on to it because it's what they know. But my, my interest in freediving is to see the sport of freediving become a large mainstream spectator sport. And I do ev- almost everything I do is with that in mind. Um, uh, for, for example, in any uh, social media and stuff that I put out or anything, that any interviews that I do, I never refer to, uh, except in this interview, obviously, but this is more of a freediving interview, I never refer to the disciplines as constant weight and then constant weight no fins. I simply refer to it as with fins or no fins because constant weight is a ridiculous term. In, in, in English, it makes no sense. And for it to make sense, you need to have a pretty solid knowledge of the history of freediving development. So it's the, there's just many ridiculous things like this in freediving. And someone needs to sit down and just bloody go through it and take out anything that's going to stop a, a person who knows nothing about freediving to stop the, you know, that's it, take take these things out. They're going to stop these people from actually becoming fans. People like fancy words, though, Adam, especially if they're like from French, you know. Mate, t- tell me about it. The French are the ones that did all this to us. <laughs> I'll never forgive <laughs> them again. <laughs> again, the French. Yeah. No. In in competitions organized by CMAS, um, a blackout disqualifies a diver from the competition. Do you think that's that rule right, should be implemented in either competition? One hundred percent, I do. And now, uh, I mean, look, I tell you what, this, I tell you what, the, this is the new uh, service protocol for CMAS, which, just so you know, um, a, about 30 odd of, uh, about, there was a, a group of about 30 of the world's best free divers in the group chat. And uh, we basically had a direct line to chat with the president of CMAS. And she said, okay, what do you think we should do with the service protocol? And we all had a big chat and we wrote it and they accepted it. Very simple, right? <laughs> and this is the service protocol from now on. You come up. Um, and you have, uh, I think they've given us 30 seconds, but I think 20 seconds would be fine, to just give an OK sign, and that's it. Um, now, one of the things they have changed, for example, is what constitutes dipping. For example, in ADA, you can hang onto the line, literally have a complete blackout, fold back so the back of your head touches the water, but as long as your airways, as long as your lips and your nose don't touch the water, you bounce back and you do service protocol on time, and you're fine, and that's happened many times. Um, in CMAS, dipping constitutes the back of the head or the chin touching the water. Now, this stops people from having big sambas. It stops people from, like, blacking out and coming back, right? You have to be in real control to stop your chin from hitting the water or the back of your head from hitting the water. So I think that the CMAS uh, service protocol actually does stop people from pushing themselves to the point of hypoxia, whereas the ADA one doesn't whatsoever. And I would personally, if I could design the service protocol... It would be the CMS one, but with 20 seconds, not 30 seconds. It also is much better for, for spectators. It makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I've been I've been talking to uh, other divers about this too, that from the spectator's point of view, um, uh, the blackouts are just like, if you don't know what's going on and you're not used to that, it's just like horrific. You think, like, that, you mean, think, like, that you think they've died. Yeah, I mean, you think that people, are, you also just think like, why would people do that to themselves? You know, it's like, 
it's like going it's like watching somebody going rock climbing with uh with no gear and like crashing mm-hmm. to the ground and breaking their ankle and then getting up and doing it again or something like that that's so right like, that's right i think i think one of the issues with ada is that uh the only way that things can change is for the entire ada assembly to vote on it so like the ada representative from each ada national around the world to to vote on these things and so i feel like our sport of freediving is controlled by all these people who don't really have anything to do with the sport of freediving and are not integral or at the center of the sport of freediving and it's just it's just a shame for me because it means that i think i think very sadly ada may go under because it's not able to keep up with with what the athletes are going to want, and so the athletes will move over to a different organization. So what you're saying is there's a lot of there's a lot of shouting going on at the moment from the athletes, but uh, I does not listen. That is ex- that is exactly right. There's a lot of shouting going on, and they don't they just they're, they're like oh well, what can we do? Our hands are tied. It's like we'll actually do something. Like let's change the sport. Let's change some of the way that we do things. Um, because in, look, I mean. I, Freediving is, is a sport of, of all levels, right? But if we are going to take this thing mainstream, then what's going to be important are the best divers in the world, right? And if the best divers in the world are all competing for CMAS, then it doesn't leave a lot to Ada in terms of international broadcasts or in terms of international interest. It's also going to affect who, who regular recreational divers take their courses with, right? Uh, I mean, yes and no. I think, I think education is almost a different topic in itself because there are many different institutions which are quite embedded for freediving education. I mean, like, you know, you don't see a lot of uh, CMAS freediving courses that's going around, yeah. do you? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> but CMAS are not an educational board or body. CMAS mm. are a, a athletic regulatory body with a seat on the Olympic Committee and uh, recognition by, like, like uh, national recognition by governments. That's the difference between CMAS and ADA. Yeah, that debate is raging on at the moment. It'll be interesting to see how it uh, how it pans out. Well, you know what's going to happen. Nothing's going. <laughs> Nothing's going to happen. I I don't I don't believe no. Uh, look, I I love I love Ada. I just um, I think that um, having uh, what is effectively a international worldwide freediving club running the sport is not the best. As in, um, someone needs to have executive power and someone needs to be able to make changes. And, uh, you know what? Some divers might not like that change, the, the changes and it might affect some di- divers negatively. Um, for example, I tell you, I tell you what, um, this might not be a super popular, um, opinion, but there were, there Go were on. some, Sounds uh, good. there were, pardon, yeah. well, there, there were quite a few dives this year, uh, sorry, at the World Championships that I think, uh, should have played out differently. They should have been white cards, um, or, or there should have been different results. Um, but and 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 but but they, but these divers got disqualified, and that sucks for those divers. But it was good for the sport, you know. And I won't go into exactly what dives and what decisions they were, but there are many cases where one or two diver, one or two divers gets uh, the short end of the stick in order to maintain the integrity of the sport. And you know, like. It, it just, it, we just need to see more of that. <laughs> more integrity for the sport. Yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of, I mean, it, it seems that it's inevitable that, you know, it has to change now that it has this kind of media coverage that happened. That's this right. Year, right? It's just right. Not- Hundreds of thousands of people watched those live streams. The view count is obscene. And, you know, that was the first year as well. And I'm sure right. it's going to improve, like, the quality of the stream and the quality of the images yep. and the information that's on yep. the screen. It's, it really is going to take off, I think. I think so, too. So um, you've, got a, you've got a YouTube channel, uh, Adam Friedman. Mm-hmm. We spoke about it earlier. So you upload these. I think they're... I really love them because they're 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 fun and they're funny as well. Um, <laughs> you obviously come across as somebody who doesn't take themselves too seriously, which is... Um, <laughs> Well, it's dangerous, did you know that? It's very dangerous to take yourself seriously. God, I know, yeah, yeah. I've been suffering all my life for that uh, <laughs> <laughs> personality trait of mine. Um, mm-hmm. So what inspired you to start the channel, and what do you what do you kind of aim to accomplish with the videos? Well, i tell you what. Um, okay, this is, when I, it all started, for me, the whole social media shebang <laughs> all started... Um, a few years ago with uh, Facebook and Instagram. And I, I made an account because uh, I was sick of 
uh, when I told people that I was a free dive or that I free dive, they asked me how high the cliff was that I jumped off. Um, <laughs> I was sick of getting that response, and so I, I, I started my uh, my accounts basically trying to, you know, expose what freediving was to people, and I, I did that by, uh, you know, the beautiful imagery involved in freediving, and people seemed to be quite receptive to it, and then, you know, as the years went on, I thought to myself, God, well, you know, people still, like, they see some pictures, but they still don't really know what it is that freedivers do, and so I started shooting some videos of, like, my life, and, like, this is me traveling here, and the first one I made was this... Um, was uh, about the comp in Dominica. That was the first video I ever made and put up. And people really liked it, and so I just started making more. And then all these people were like, oh, man, like, how do you do that? And I said, okay, well, I'll make a tutorial about how to hold your breath longer. And they liked that. And like, oh, God, well, how about I make a tutorial on how to equalize properly? And so people liked that. And so it really just, the whole thing just sort of started kind of organically um, out of me just wanting more, wanting more people to know about freediving and what, the, what it was, this thing that we do. Um, and it sort of just turned into, you know, me making tutorials about freediving to help people improve their own diving and, uh, me filming my life as I gallivant around the world. <laughs> um, yeah, they're really good, man. They're great. Keep them coming. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I think, um, it's kind of weird. Like there was just this, uh, I don't know, just the way that freediving is kind of becoming, you know, exponentially more, more more people are becoming aware of it in the last couple mm. of years is uh I, it's hard to tell whether it's just me being more aware of the media or whether the media is actually no it's the like media is definitely more yeah, aware of it i, I mean look, put this way man i i'm in an advil ad in the states at the <laughs> that's hilarious pretty mainstream <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh that's that's fantastic um wow <laughs> Um, no, I think, I think, it, I think, um, I mean, obviously, you know, where, when you have companies as well, like SSI and then Paddy getting involved in the educational side of freediving, it also, it, it does a lot for, uh, making freediving feel like a normal thing, not like this crazy extreme sport and, you know, getting as many people as possible involved in it. And the reach is just more, it's just greater and greater. Now there are more just free divers out there in the world than there ever have been, um, and then the the media, in many ways, has fallen in love with the imagery of it all, all that beautiful underwater imagery. So, um, ah, look, the stage is set for some continual growth, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of like, you know, the other sports that the media usually covers, um, the media is quite saturated with them already. So the media is kind of exactly. like looking for something, the, the kind of next new thing that it can kind of exploit to Oh, absolutely, people. absolutely. And it just happens to be happening at the time when... Um, when free diving, the, the you know just everyone has a camera now. Everyone has a GoPro. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. A lot of people are doing the courses, so a lot of people are diving to ten or fifteen, twenty meters to take yep. these shots. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely it's good for the sport. It's it, I think all the the increased coverage and the debate on Facebook about you know safety issues and all this kind of thing that we've been talking about is it is helping to keep people accountable as well. Um, yeah where before it was a little bit of like a, a wild west kind of uh yeah. Right? yeah well there's still a bit of wild west going on but you know <laughs> um let's enjoy the last days of the uh the wild west and the free diving exactly yeah. <laughs> exactly i i usually try my very best to stay out of all those facebook arguments they just um they just ruin your day don't they you've been running these uh deep weeks in uh mm -hmm. bali with alexei mm -hmm. Molchinov. Mm -hmm. Well, he, this is the first one he's going to be on. Usually, it's just me. Flying oh, really? Solo. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, well, me and, and and a bunch of other instructors. Yeah. So you you offer coaching and training through the week. Can you talk talk us through what you would expect if we joined for the week? Well, basically, uh, what what it is, it's it's an eight day free diving camp with a large group of people, and it's really it's really fun and dynamic because we have so many instructors and so many students of varying levels. So um, people are often like picking up little things uh, from all the different students and all the different instructors and several different approaches, right? So it's kind of a smorgasbord of uh, approaches, techniques, and knowledge, right? Um, uh, and so basically what we do is we usually, people are coming, and you can complete your courses on it, so people are coming to um, do their freediver course or their advanced freediver course or their master freediver course. So we usually spend the first few days going through all the course material itself 
and then we're left with sort of like, you know, five or six days, depending on which course people are doing, um, of just fun diving, like getting deeper, or diving on wrecks in the area, working on training, working on different techniques and skills and things like that. So, um, uh, yeah, so in the past it had been me that was just running it with uh, like a, a bunch of instructors who were assisting me. And now me and Alexi are going to do it together, um, mostly because, uh, you know, he's, he'll be really good at deflecting from me. <laughs> <laughs> so when something goes wrong, I'll, be, I'll go and talk with Alexi. <laughs> uh, if the listeners are interested in uh, joining, do you still have spaces for the next uh, No, the next it's, it's all, well, Deep Week is all booked out, um, the, ne- well, the next one is. So we've, we've opened up a second week that will run straight after it. So we've got two of them now. So the first one, which is the 14th until the 11th of November, is full. Um, but then we have uh, space on the 12th until the 19th of November for another deep week. Exactly the same thing as well. Right. So if, if listeners are interested in finding out about it and maybe joining, where should they go to to find out about it? Uh, flick me an email to uh, adam.thomas.stern at gmail.com, A-D-A-M dot T-H-O-M-A-S dot S-T-E-R-N at gmail.com. Or they can message my Facebook or Instagram or whatever. I think it's pretty easy to find me online. Yeah, I'll, I'd love to join myself. I think maybe it's going to happen yeah. until next year. Hopefully you're still doing, doing them next year. I will still do them and I'll probably have a very special guest coming next year as well. Nice. Who could be more yeah. special than an Alexei Molchanov? Well, there's only other one diver, is there? <laughs> right, I'm going to save myself for that then. Um, no, I don't know. Nothing's confirmed. I just like to talk. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about your gear. What do you? What equipment do you like to use? Which brands? What are you using now? Um, well, uh, I use all Molchanov gear. Um, and I use all Molchanov gear because I was in the very enviable position where I, I, uh, sort of, um, I could have reached out and gotten sponsorship from any freediving brand in the world at, at, the, at the time frame. And I sort of thought to myself, God, what am I going to do? You know, like, uh, what, 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 what company would be the best for me? Like what, what company would, I first started thinking about who, who can I get money out of? Right. And then I just thought to myself, why don't I just choose the gear that I like to use? And before I was sponsored by anyone, I was using uh, Molchanov gear. And so I just uh, actually just had a chat with Alexi, uh, Alexi Molchanov, who you know, owns the Molchanov brand. And I had a chat with him and we just said, oh, yeah, cool. I, yeah, he was like, yeah, I'd sponsor you. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, that's what I'm doing now. So all my, my wetsuits and my uh, fins and my nose grips and all, yeah, all the paraphernalia, it's all Molchanovs. Um, because I, uh, I like them. I like, I think it's the best gear there is, to be dead honest. Mm-hmm. Your, your, your wetsuits as well, did you say? Yeah. Well, I mean, at the, at the moment, uh, well, I'm not sure was, um, well, like, okay, you know that, that standard, um, Oceana comps that, that was designed by, uh, Alexi. And so they're like, it's effectively, it's a Moltron suit and the, uh, Moltron's resell them. So, um, but yeah, so it's all Moltron's. You've done a bit of traveling. You've been around. Mm. Um, is there anywhere that stands out in your mind? Like, let's say, if I told you that you had to spend, you could spend the rest of your life diving every single day, but you could only do Oof. it in one place. What well, choose? that's hard because I'd have to choose the Bahamas for the blue hole. Mm-hmm. Um, You're not the first one that said that, that's for sure. Yeah, but I don't like, I mean, Long Island is, it's, a, <laughs> it's not my favorite place on earth. Mm-hmm. The blue hole wasn't there. I wouldn't go there. <laughs> right. So um, if if you had to compromise and choose a dive location where you could spend the rest of your time lazing around on the beach and enjoying the local culture, where would that be? It would have to be uh, one of the uh, Caribbean islands. It might be Dominica or even Roatan. Probably Dominica, actually. Dominica is stunning. Do- the, the diving conditions in Dominica are on par with the blue hole. So I think I'd probably choose that over the Bahamas, to be dead honest, because the Bahamas is beautiful, but there's just not a lot going on there. And I, I think I, I need a little bit more stimulus than, than is on Long Island. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're welcome to, uh, if you ever pass by Taiwan, come and, uh, come and stay for a couple of days and I'll show you around. Oh, man, well. I'd love to dive Taiwan. I've actually wanted to for a while. Um, yeah. The diving's meant to be pretty nice there, isn't it? It depends, yeah, but I mean... Considering that we're so far north, um, yeah, I mean, mm. and the, here in the south of Taiwan, it's essentially tropical um, most of the year round, yeah. and we get you know cool. really beautiful visibility. 
Like, yeah. uh, really, you know, we have an amazing sea turtle sanctuary, sanctuary um, quite close to That's where I live. So Green Island? Uh, Green Island, I haven't been to yet, but yeah, it's supposed oh, to be okay. amazing there. Yeah, Green Island, Orchid Island. But even just like cool. 90 minutes from my house, there's a small yeah. small coral island where I do most of my oh, epic. diving and training. And um, epic. Yeah, man, I'm so lucky, you know, it's like uh, I really feel for these people who live in like Quebec, you know, who, you know. Mm. <laughs> Um, oh man, I, I feel for anyone that lives in a country or in a part of a country where it snows in the winter. That sounds very cold to me. But I mean, even where you live in, uh, but I mean, you you don't get the depth, right? You just can't get the depth. So no, you're, no, we can't. We can't even though you depth. might like, have all the, all that beautiful water out there, you can't really exploit it, right? No, nah, not at all. I mean, the thing is, this is the thing about like in in the Sydney area, the the conditions are quite rough. You know, it, it, it breeds a good diver because, you know, like, um, you know, we're often uh, in swell and wind and choppy, like choppy water and there's current and bad viz and things like that. So, um, but obviously different parts of Australia are incredible as well. But the Sydney area is not the best. Mm-hmm. But do you actually teach uh, free diving courses out there in the open water? Well, I certainly do. I mean, like, what kind of depth do you get just off the shore there? Uh, we usually go off a boat. You can go to places right. where you get 20 meters, uh, you know, a short swim it. from shore. Yeah, but if you want deeper than that, you got to take a boat. So most of my courses, we go out on a boat. What other interests do you have? I also, I also have this question uh, about morning rituals, but something tells me mm-hmm. you don't have a morning ritual, so... Um, I like to drink coffee and do a nice big poo. Yeah, nice. <laughs> In that order? Uh, usually, yes. That's yeah, the best order. Um... <laughs> What other interests do you have outside of freediving? I know you, you're really into writing, right? You mentioned before mm-hmm. that you were doing drama and stuff before, and I've heard bef- mm-hmm. that you're, you, you want to focus more on getting back to the fiction writing. Is that right? Well, I mean, uh, I wanted to be a novelist for most of my life, and I always thought that I would be. And uh, at the moment, my writing has taken a backseat to freediving, but I still write all the time, and I always will, I imagine. And eventually I'll publish some books, I hope. <laughs> that would be lovely. <laughs> so um, what kind of stuff do you write um well uh let's let's say it's literary fiction all right so like non-genre kind of stuff exactly do you have a, a favorite author or a book that you would like yeah, to recommend I, to the to the listeners oh, i have two favorite authors um uh charles dickens and margaret atwood charles dickens is hilarious I think people were forced to read him in school, and so they they forget that he's actually a like a a spectacular writer and a, a, like a very comedic writer. Like his books are still hilarious. A bit like Mark Twain uh, in that sense, then, right? Like, that's that's uh, right. Yeah. yeah, you get forced to read him in school, and so you don't like it. But oh man, he's great. Um, man, David Copperfield is my favorite book of all time. Uh, that is a beautiful, beautiful story. And Margaret Atwood, did you say? Margaret Atwood. Yeah, she's a Canadian author. And she writes, like, uh, it's just these incredibly intimate stories. Um, I tell you what, uh, I mean, you may have known, some of her big ones are like uh, The Blind Assassin or Oryx and Craig. Um, they, they recently made a, I think Netflix recently made a TV series about uh, one of her books, The Handmaid's Tale. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. I think most folk will know that one, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, they're, they're just, most of her stuff is kind of dystopic, um, semi-fantasy, but not in a, you know, tacky way. <laughs> yeah. um, but I tell you what, I think the, her, one of her best, uh, which I think would probably have the, the most general appeal, is, is uh, Oryx and Craig. Um, how do you even spell that? O-R-Y-X and Craig. They're, they're obscure animal names, just so you know. Um, it's a phenomenal read, actually, so people should definitely have a look at that. Yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll put that stuff in the show notes and link to them so people can uh, cool. check them out. Yeah, I'm Epic. always uh, looking for for the next good read. <laughs> so, Adam, what's the um, if you could just kind of like summarize your plans or dreams for the future? Do you have like a? Are you going to take over the world, or is it just one day at a time? Uh, it's just one day at a time. I think. Um, I think sometimes. Uh, sometimes I have this thing in my head where I'm like, I imagine this master plan and then other times I just wake <laughs> up in the morning and I'm just like, what am I going to do today? Let's just, do you know, have, my, just have coffee yeah, and poo. I'll take it yeah, let's have a coffee and a poo. Yeah, I, I just want to enjoy my life. You know what I mean? I, 
uh, I just want to wake up every morning and not be locked into a, a life that I didn't choose. Or so I think all my decisions are based on: uh, is this going to allow me to continue having a lot of freedom in my life? And and that's basically it. To just yeah, I suppose as the years go on, to in- increase the amount of freedom I have in my life and. Part of that might be monetary, as in, you know, because if you do have more cash flow coming in, you get more options, as in, maybe I'll go here and do this, or, you know, I don't have to work so much at the moment, because I tell you what, I had enough years being poor. <laughs> that's um, that's the funny thing, when people, people ask me, like, oh, you know, like, how did you become a professional freediver? And I was like, well, I was just really poor for many years, <laughs> and only recently started making enough money to even, even make a living. So... Um, I just, uh, yeah, it's, I just want to continue having a lot of freedom in my life, a lot of freedom to travel, a lot of freedom to spend time now with my soon-to-be wife and just hang out and uh, enjoy myself, enjoy my life. Nice. Yeah, I think what you said there about um, just having, like, I- increasing or continuing freedom, is the, it's just the best goal, isn't it? You know, like... Mm, absolutely. And as far as money goes, of course, you need money to, uh, I guess, improve your chances in that regard. But if you have... Even if someone offers you a million bucks to stay in the same place, you know, yeah, no way. Life, it's like you know, it's just not worth it, is it? No, maybe a hundred million would make it worth it. But yeah, even hundred million and then run away, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, no, but yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, the thing is, I, I have found that as I am making more money, um, I'm able to be actually a little bit less stressed because I was always really stressed about money because I was always, I suppose, like you know, just teaching and running my own business to get by. I found, you know, for many years, I lived in like a constant state of anxiety about would I have enough money for this or would I have enough money to to compete next year or for the next competition? Like, how would I afford my flights, you know? And I was constantly racking up this credit card bill. And it's it's nice not to have that anymore. Um, It's it's just, yeah, it's nice not to be stressed all the time. Uh, And that's a freedom in itself. (laughs) You have very admirable goals, and uh, I wish you all the best in your uh, uh, thank you so much your journey and your you know your continuing uh, career as an athlete. Um, thank you. Yeah, man, and it's really like I re- I really love the videos and I really love the kind of the attitude and the face that you bring to free diving and um, you know I, I'm definitely one of the yoga guys who gets up and stretches and uh, hums and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I think we definitely need. Um, uh, we need more laughing and and you know fun and and less seriousness in the in the free yeah. community. Oh, I agree. I think a lot more fun is definitely needed. So you're a very a very good ambassador, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks, Adam. Hopefully, uh, talk to you again at some point in the future. Until then, absolutely. Have a great day. Have a great night. I will. Thanks, bro. See you. Speak to you soon. That was an awesome insight into Adam's views on many aspects of freediving, as well as a look into the mindset of one of the best freedivers in the world. You can find me on Facebook as Donny Mac, D-O-N-N-Y-M-A-C, and I'm on Instagram as Donny McFar, D-O-N-N-Y-M-C-F-A-R. Feel free to get in touch if you have any questions or suggestions. Thanks for listening, special thanks to the patrons for supporting the show, and remember to subscribe to the podcast through your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode.